News headlines from the KSD TV newsroom. We've covered more than seven decades of news in St. Louis. Well, we're doing a very satisfactory job, apparently. We don't seem to get many complaints. From historic firsts. I like working outside and people are nice. To the push for civil rights and social change. Yes, some of Kinlock has progressed, but too much has stood still. Coverage that kept us glued to our TVs. Its magnitude is a hundred times greater than a five alarm fire would be. And stories that made us all proud to call St. Louis home. Your new Miss America, Debbie Turner, Miss Missouri. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kay Quinn. KSDK has been on the air 75 years. That means we have 75 years worth of footage all on film and tape, and we have it stored here in our special archive room. Each Thursday during the noon and 4 p.m. newscasts, we take a look back at some of that footage in our vintage KSDK segments. Now we've compiled our best vintage stories for you. February 8th is always a special day here at Five on Your Side. On that day in 1947, our station went on the air for the very first time. And we were also one of the first television stations on the air in the entire nation. We owe it all to one man. London, 1936. George Burback says it was a family vacation abroad that inspired him to bring television to St. Louis. The radio and newspaper executive was on a trip with his wife when they spotted a sign that would eventually change the way St. Louisans got their daily news. It read, come in and see television. Where most people saw fuzzy pictures and terrible sound, Burback saw unlimited possibilities. When he returned home, he started a campaign to bring television to St. Louis. Burback had connections. He was the general manager of KSD Radio and the advertising manager of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch at the time. He wrote a letter to RCA inviting executives to come to St. Louis to discuss bringing a television station here. This was all happening right in the middle of World War II. After visiting our town, RCA would build the first post-war transmitter for the Pulitzer Publishing Company. Then the FCC granted KSD a license for a television channel. Then came February 8, 1947, the day KSD signed on the air, becoming St. Louis's first television station. There were only about four television sets in the entire viewing area. That's not surprising, considering a television set cost $625 back then. That's equivalent to about $7,100 today. So people crowded around sets at Union Electric and department store windows to get their first look at television. Programming that first day consisted of news, interviews, dancing, and a sports show featuring a young Cardinals catcher named Joe Garagiola. I'd like to uh, talk to you about the good people in St. Louis and our television operation out there. How's it coming along? Well, we're doing a very satisfactory job, apparently. We don't seem to get many complaints. George Burback retired from KSD in 1958. He died the following year, but will forever be remembered as the man who brought television to St. Louis. We've seen our fair share of presidential stops in both Missouri and Illinois, but it was a special moment back in 1950 when then-President Harry Truman, a Missouri native, made a campaign stop in his home state. On Saturday, November 4th, he arrived at Scott Air Force Base on the Independence, the first presidential plane with a bald eagle on the nose. The term Air Force One wouldn't be used until 1953 when President Eisenhower was in office. President Truman's schedule included a welcome ceremony on the tarmac and a nationally broadcast political speech. Following a dinner in downtown St. Louis hosted by then-Mayor Joseph Darst, Truman was whisked to the Keele Auditorium where a crowd heard from the four Democrats up for election in Missouri, including Thomas Hennings, who was running for the U.S. Senate. Hennings would go on to win the following Tuesday. Truman's speech that night was an appeal to keep the U.S. in the League of Nations and avoid isolationism. The president also told the crowd the midterm elections would decide the kind of world citizens would live in for years to come. Truman spent the night in St. Louis and left for Kansas City Sunday. Two days later on Tuesday, November 7th, Election Day, he cast his ballot in his hometown of Independence, Missouri. 
fast forward to the mid-1960s. That's when one of the most interesting stories from our city's past played out. An amusement park named Disneyland opened in Anaheim, California, 10 years earlier. And in the fall of 1964, a plan was in the works to bring a Midwestern Disneyland to St. Louis. Walt Disney himself visited our town in late 1964 and gave city leaders some ideas for the project. And uh, so it will be in one building, we will have our own sky, and uh, we'll have complete control of the weather, and it, that means that it can be for summer and through the winter. It would be just north of Bush Memorial Stadium, which was then under construction. The proposed site was a two-block strip of land where the Hilton St. Louis at the ballpark sits right now. Proposals called for a town modeled after Disneyland's Main Street, but with a St. Louis and New Orleans flavor. The children go there and have a ball, but they're under control. And I think that might very well happen here. But from the beginning, some thought the site wasn't big enough, and the price tag, estimated at between 30 and 50 million dollars, was too rich for the local group interested in investing. By early July of 1965, Disney himself turned down a proposal from the city of St. Louis. Channel 5 reporter Bob Chase took to the streets to ask St. Louisans how to fill the void. The musical entertainment is nice, like they have, you know, the operas and things like that. The thing that you have in New York, like um, Rockefeller Center, that sort of thing. Well, I'd like to see some type of entertainment facility down there. In the end, financing was the deal breaker. Disney had insisted the entire project would have to be paid by St. Louis investors without any financial help from the Disney Corporation at all. Our region has dealt with its share of disasters. Six decades ago, the land at Oakland and Mackland Avenue was the scene of a major emergency. An amusement park sat on the land now occupied by St. Louis Community College. And on July 19, 1963, it all went up in flames. Fire broke out in one of the park's kitchens and quickly spread. Strong winds fed the flames, which consumed the Ferris wheel, rides, and restaurants. Everything but the swimming pool. A fire of even more historic proportions caused priceless damage to millions of files detailing the military service of American men and women. On July 12, 1973, flames began burning at the record center on Page where those files were kept. It burned out of control for 22 hours. The exact cause was never determined. In the aftermath, painstaking efforts were made to salvage the damaged records. In the 1960s and 70s, reporter Chris Condon was a powerhouse here at the station. He died in February of 2023. But in his heyday, he was an anchor and reporter, interviewing people as famous as Dr. Martin Luther King and conducting more man-on-the-street interviews than just about any other single reporter on the air. In this next story, Chris shows us his versatility as he talks with our area's first female mail carrier. When reporter Chris Condon interviewed St. Louis's first female mail carrier, Barbara Gleason. What do you like about it most? I like working outside and the people are nice. I like it. You run into anybody uh, who didn't like the idea of a female uh, postman? Oh, once in a while a man said to me he'd like to take a housekeeping job. See, and I got a man's job. <laughs> what about that great problem of uh, postmen generally, dogs? Do you um, run into any... Uh, yeah, one came nipping at me a little bit, but I told him to quit it, and he quit. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, weight? This should be great for uh, taking off uh, pounds, especially in this uh, very hot weather. Well, it's surprising, but I gained 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> you don't eat while you're walking the route, do you? No, I don't, but it just raised my appetite, and I gained 10. I'm losing it now. I lost about three pounds now. You've had three weeks now. You think you'll stay with it? I sure will. Here's a fun fact. Sarah Black is the first known woman appointed to carry mail in the U.S. She was appointed on April 3, 1845, and her Charleston, Maryland mail route earned her a whopping $48 a year. Did you know intense heat can create its own wind? It happened here during a disaster in downtown St. Louis in 1976. Some of our oldest stories live back in these film cans. These are archives that go back to the 1950s and 60s. We have thousands of these cans, stacks and stacks of them. 
One of the stories you'll find inside involves a firestorm. It happens when intense heat from a fire causes its own wind system. And that's what happened in St. Louis back on April 2nd, 1976. The abandoned Heyday Shoe Building caught fire. This is a firestorm. Uh, its magnitude is a hundred times greater than a five alarm fire would be. April 2nd, 1976, a fire started in the vacant Heyday Shoe Building at 21st and Locust. The building had been empty for years after being gutted by a previous fire, which set the stage for this fire to spread quickly. A firestorm is a situation where the intensity of the fire is such that it creates terrific wind current. The wind was so intense, it blew helmets off firefighters a block away and made putting the fire out extremely difficult. To approach the fire with any water was almost an impossibility. The wind would break it up before it would reach it. And this is the intensity that is considered to be a storm. It took more than 200 firefighters and 51 fire trucks to get this firestorm under control. Eight firefighters suffered minor injuries. Six buildings and a pumper truck were destroyed. Four other buildings were damaged. This is the worst storm I've been involved in. 32 years, that's right. In the spring of 2022, we were one of the lucky cities chosen to experience Vincent Van Gogh's paintings in a whole new light. It was an interactive display called Beyond Van Gogh, the immersive experience. But it's not the first time the iconic artist made an impression on St. Louis. Go back with me in time to January 1970 when an exhibit of works by Vincent van Gogh was underway at the St. Louis Art Museum. When an exhibit of the works of artist Vincent van Gogh was underway at the St. Louis Art Museum, we found film in the Five on Your Side archives of the paintings and drawings being installed and an extensive interview with art museum curators. We've hung the exhibition chronologically so that when one comes into the exhibition you begin with the, the early works and then you move through the various periods and finally the last picture you see is the picture that belongs to the museum, which is one of the greatest of all, in my opinion. The show drew record crowds as it traveled the country and was curated by the artist's nephew. These frames are, are, are nothing very ornate. Is that, is that planned that way? Well, it's, it's planned that way. The uh, director of the Van Gogh Foundation is the present Vincent Van Gogh, the nephew of the artist. And it is his theory that these paintings look their best in narrow frames of this kind. St. Louis Art Museum curators said they would have liked to see the works displayed in more elaborate frames and thought the simpler frames might have been chosen to better preserve the works as they traveled. Fast forward to today, and the works of Vincent van Gogh continue to draw crowds in the metro area. The Beyond Van Gogh exhibit extended its St. Louis run twice due to high ticket sales. So far, more than 100,000 people have visited the display. It runs through March 30th. Did you know that Van Gogh painted his most famous painting, The Starry Night, while he was in an insane asylum? That's according to an organization called Art in Action. That painting now hangs in MoMA, which is the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. St. Louis was a leader in the civil rights movement. When we come back, some pivotal moments all caught on film and preserved in our archives. Five on Your Side's vast archives include the rich history of the civil rights movement in St. Louis. Many of those stories played out over decades, like the implosion of the pruitt Igo public housing complex. Built in the 1950s, it was considered a masterpiece of urban planning. By the 60s, the buildings had fallen into disrepair. A years-long debate over their fate ended when they were torn down in 1972. The Jefferson Bank protests of 1963 are considered a pivotal moment in the local civil rights movement. In October of that year, protesters ramped up demonstrations at the bank on Washington Boulevard. It had only two black employees and community members demanded a more diverse workforce. Many believe those protests led to better job for minorities in our region. A year earlier, tensions were high after a Kinlock police officer serving a warrant shot and killed a teenager. Both the officer and the teenager were black. Riots and more shootings followed in the weeks after, but the incident led to the development of an outreach program for high school students in Kinlock. And in 1963, KSDK produced a television special highlighting that work. This is not the promised land. 
but this is a town that tries. KSDK aired the half-hour special on Kinloch on December 10, 1963. It described a town that had been growing since the 1930s, a safe haven for African Americans fleeing the poverty of the South. Some of the words and terms used in the program are no longer considered appropriate today, but the inequality it shed a light on in many ways hasn't changed. Yes, some of Kinloch has progressed, but too much has stood still. By 1960, opportunities in the largest black community in the country hadn't kept pace with the population. The disparities would reach a boiling point after the fatal shooting of a black teen by a black Kinlock police officer on September 23, 1962. Riots broke out, leading to the shootings of three police officers and the arrests of dozens of people. What is it like to be young in Kinlock? Being young in Kinloch didn't just mean living in poverty, it meant living without hope. But many of them don't achieve because graduation from high school seems like the end of the road for them. More than a year after the Kinloch riots, this TV special tried to sound a note of hope, but it also presented viewers with a grim reality. This mother, who sent four of her five children to college, described it in a sentence. For years, the children in Kinloch uh, have had two strikes against them. Uh, one strike being low income in the homes in which they're part and uh, the second strike being an inferior education. Mary Spencer was the moderator, writer, and producer of the special. She used a whiteboard to spell out glaring differences in school spending per student compared with white communities. The rest of the show outlined the results of a project meant to bring change. Private companies, led by the YMCA, recruited 20 Kinlock High School students and guided them through the college application process or into a job training program. For some of these boys and girls, it was the first time that an adult, other than a teacher, I had taken time to sit down and talk to them just about himself. In the end, 15 of the high school seniors in the program got summer jobs, 12 enrolled in college. Others chose a combination of work and night school. In all, 150 people had tried to bring about a transformation. It's impossible to celebrate St. Louis's rich history without celebrating the architecture and community planning of decades gone by. One of the most recognizable buildings in St. Louis is the Anheuser-Busch Brewery. The complex opened in 1852 and in 1966 was designated as a National Historic Landmark. April 14, 1967. Under sunny skies, dignitaries, a packed crowd, and even the famous Clydesdales, all ready to celebrate. It is a distinct honor to now award to the Anheuser-Busch Brewery a landmark plaque designating it as a National Historic Landmark. As a patriotic banner is pulled aside, the marker is officially unveiled. The historic designation was granted in 1966, but the ceremony wasn't held until the following spring. German immigrant Adolphus Busch began operating the brewery in 1852. It would grow to become the largest in the world by 1957 with his grandson Gussie at the helm. All of us at Anza Busch deeply appreciate the honor that has been given to our brewery. Today, the property is a National Historic Landmark District with three buildings in the complex included in the designation, the brew house, the administration building, and the stables. What does it mean besides putting a plaque on the building? Well, it means that the owner agrees to maintain the historic integrity of the property. Here's a fun fact about Anheuser-Busch. Anheuser-Busch started as a small neighborhood brewery and grew into an international giant. In 1901, AB was brewing about a million barrels of beer a year, but by 2002, that number had jumped to 100 million. Coming up, an inspiring step back to 1989, the year a veterinary student would become the first Miss Missouri to take the crown of Miss America. When she was crowned Miss America, she lived out the dreams of millions of girls. Debbie Turner also captured hearts all across the bi-state the night she won that title in 1989. In this sparkling gem from our archives, we relive the moment a veterinary student at Mizzou became the first and only Miss Missouri to ever be crowned Miss America. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome your new Miss America, Debbie Turner.
September 16, 1989, Miss Missouri, Debbie Turner, a talented singer and pianist who played Flight of the Bumblebee on the marimba, won the 63rd annual Miss America pageant. Miss America, the runway is yours. Oh, I remember every inch of it. 31 years later, Debbie, who describes herself as a little country girl originally from Arkansas, says it was a profound moment of affirmation and validation. And I did not feel like the most beautiful girl in the world, nothing like that, um, but I felt seen. After a two-hour competition in Atlantic City, New Jersey, nothing would ever be the same. It truly changed the trajectory of my life, having been raised in a lower middle class, single parent home uh, with high standards. My mother expected a lot from me and my sister, um, but I never dreamt that I would have had the experiences that uh, becoming Miss America would afford me in the years to come. Debbie Turner would spend the next year traveling the country as Miss America 1990, using her reign to motivate and inspire young people. In 1991, she finished her final year of veterinary school, and six years after winning the crown, she'd win our hearts when she jumped into our living rooms. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Debbie Turner. Dr. Debbie Turner began her broadcast journalism career as host of Show Me St. Louis alongside John Pertzborn. I was conflicted because I, at that point, was still a fairly new graduate of veterinary school and I wasn't practicing veterinary medicine and I felt guilty about it. So I talked to a veterinarian uh, who was a mentor of mine and um, he said, Debbie, you can do more good for animals and animal welfare on television talking to thousands or millions of people than you can spaying one dog at a time. And that was the permission I needed. Show Me St. Louis would lead to a 27-year career in broadcast journalism, including 11 years in network television at CBS News. She can still be seen as a contributor on Animal Planet and National Geographic. Since her days as Miss America, Dr. Debbie Turner Bell has never stopped bringing her message of personal excellence and goal setting to students, corporations, and charities around the world. She divides her time doing leadership development, motivational and Christian speaking, television broadcasting, and working at her local church. Her most important roles, wife to husband Gerald Bell, and mom to her 10-year-old daughter. And while St. Louis is no longer home, Dr. Debbie Turner Bell will always cherish memories of her time here. I miss St. Louis. I mostly miss the friends and family that I made while I was there. So hello and love <laughs> everybody uh, that I know. We have a lot more video from our archive room and we're so excited to share more of our vintage stories with you. Remember, you can watch the latest pieces on Five on Your Side every Thursday at noon and 4 p.m. Thanks so much for joining me on this trip down memory lane.